Hello, and welcome back to How to Start Up with your host. I'm Rowan Sinclair, as you can probably tell from the face. Uh, I am here with Baran Korkmaz. Have I pronounced your surname correctly? Because I'm, I'm having an issue with surnames yeah. recently. Was it all right? I mean, I, I think that was spot on. Um, it had a little bit of an accent, but that's <laughs> fine, you know? We moved. <laughs> I'm not, I, I don't know what happens. I have to put, I put on a slight <laughs> accent if it's a name that isn't isn't easily pronounceable in my head, but, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, so, so Baron no is the uh, founder and CEO of Arway, which, my understanding, is an indoor augmented reality navigation app. Now, Baron, you're going to have to um, tell me exactly what that means. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, the simplest way I can really explain it is just to say, look, there's Google Maps, and we're doing that for the indoors. Um, so we also use AR. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it. So like Pokemon Go or uh, with Snapchat filters. Um, what we do is we basically lead you to your destination using augmented reality. So visualizing your path um, and creating that you know ex- immersive experience uh, within AR. So we've worked with a few different brands to to yeah really. Um, well, we built the core technology and they customized the experience. Wow. Now, what everyone who might be listening isn't aware as well is that you are currently sporting the ripe old age of 17. Yeah. <laughs> which is incredible. So you've kicked off a business and you actually you actually started this three years ago, wasn't it? Uh, around the age of 14. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I first started off really as just like a project um, just to do in my spare time uh, in summer. Mm-hmm. So I was actually inspired by the Grenfell incident. Um, so again, like our whole uh, starting journey really started off when uh, I wanted to find a solution to just basically track people indoors using phones and just se- uh, like send those communications to the authorities like firefighters. Um, so yeah, I first started out a very simple prototype um, I took it to a few award shows and like um, exhibitions, uh, picked up some traction and uh, yeah, went on Sky News from there, got some more attention. And uh, after that, I was actually working with like a, a beacon company to integrate the solution with. And then I decided, okay, uh, how do I commercialize this? And that's where the shift really happened from a project, which was something I did in my spare time as I was like a, you know, early programmer. I wanted to build something cool to then like a startup where I said, okay, actually I need people who are smarter than me around me to, to really build this out. Uh, so that was around uh, 2018 to 2019. That's when the sh- transition really happened um, where, yeah, I mean, in, in 2019, we signed our first client, uh, which was, well, actually it was a pilot we did with a hospital. And then from there, we went on uh, to, to now uh, working with uh, one of the largest shopping malls in the world, uh, all the way out in Taiwan, for example. And uh, the way we get those kind of opportunities is we sell a development kit. So, you know, we don't actually directly work with the uh, you know shopping malls or each of the hospitals themselves. We sell the development kit for other companies to integrate the solution into. Um, so very simply... Uh, we make the technology and they customize it and put their own name on it. So it's almost like a white label product that you're giving them, but you've got all the tools and everything in the navigation kit for them to just basically slap their brand on top. Exactly. I mean, I, I don't speak Mandarin, so I, I would never know how to, to deal with a, a client out there. So <laughs> uh, we actually had a company approach us and then they said, oh, you know, can we white label your solution? And uh, yeah, that's really how it happened. That's amazing. And so obviously just taking it back to the initial stages of the venture itself, being inspired by obviously Grenfell and wanting to be able to help to, I suppose, mitigate any potential future instances that could very well happen. Um, Yeah. When did you actually start coding though? Because obviously you kicked this off at 14. When, when did you start getting into coding? How old are you? Yeah. So actually with coding, I started uh, just at 11 um, and I, I think like anyone else just saw Flappy Bird really succeed and, and apps like that. And I was like, oh, I'm going to create millions of dollars by uh, building a game or like a mobile uh, app or something. Um, and, I, and I was like really, really like, um, I guess, naive at that point. And uh, that was also a good thing because I just got started straight away, you know, just figuring out some tools, putting together some prototypes. Um, so, yeah, a lot of the early stuff I built was just crap. Um, I yeah, really didn't <laughs> you use off, any of it. You started off developing games, didn't you? Did you? What kind of games were they? Yeah, yeah. So it was like basically very. I mean, 
Flappy Bird ripoffs, for example. <laughs> I built like a few Flappy Bird ripoffs. Um, I actually never got to publish them, but um, I, I showed it to my friends. Like I got some of them to install it and, and mess around. Um, also, at that time, I was also selling software. So like I sold pirated software as well and, and did some other crazy stuff. You said you were um, selling software? So yeah, yeah. So, like, I sold editing software, for example, um, called Sony Vegas. And uh, literally, uh, I think, what was it? One of my friends got it for free. And I, you know, copied it onto a USB and I offered it as a service to, uh, yeah, you know, let everyone kickstart their YouTube careers. Uh, since I think at that time, everyone in school wanted to become like a YouTuber. So, uh, yeah, that, that was the demand and I supplied it. Yeah. Fantastic. Wow. So you're an entrepreneur from the very early stages and it wasn't just selling sweets. It was selling, it was yeah. selling SAS. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, I didn't realize that at that point, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't do, man, but it was, it's, that's amazing. Um, so you first started off doing that and then obviously with, um, with our way, but which was back then was called Imarek, right? Yeah. Was it Imarek? Yeah, How exactly. am I pronouncing it? Yeah, I, I mean, Imarek, that's what I called it. But like some people said Imarek, I mean. <laughs> what did that stand for again? Yeah. Uh, so it actually stood for Indoor Mobile Augmented Reality Evacuation and Communication. Um, and that was like the, the system's name. I actually created a white paper for this as well, like a proper scientific white paper. I sent it out to a few professors actually um, in this domain and like got some feedback. But yeah, I mean, that's when we were like really a project. And uh, when I say project, we just wanted to have firefighters use this and i went to a lot of like exhibitions with them and and you know spoke to a lot of uh, different institutions focusing on this domain um but yeah the, the the thing is it's not a really fast route to market like going through uh the, the that side of it where we wanted to sell to firefighters or have them deploy it um you know we would have to go through years and years of testing and we you know i just realized okay i could do that or i could just take this and commercialize it um take it to some shopping malls, and then later on uh, down the line, we could go back to government and uh, tell them, okay, we've got this you know, proven solution. Can we start integrating it and see if we can use the location data uh, to yeah, enhance the authorities and uh, help them with uh, any emergencies? Amazing. And because from, yeah. from there, you, you took the product itself <clears throat> and you actually ended up winning a couple of awards at the British Invention Show, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's where I actually got the recognition from uh, Sky News and, and BBC News as well. Um, so yeah, that that like really did boost uh, the sort of yeah recognition I got. And then from there, I got to work with the company who helped me build the technology to start off with. But yeah, later on, I did branch off from them. But yeah, I mean, it, it was really, really great experience. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it was just one competition. Like my dad recommended it just one day. Like, oh, look, there's this thing you should apply to. And I was like, oh, why not? <laughs> Let's just give it a go and see yeah. what happens. No, that's amazing. And yeah, yeah, exactly. And just, just, just a little tangent. Obviously, you know, being interviewed uh, by Sky News, and I think you were on a, you were on BBC. Was it Newsround as well? Yeah, yeah. Newsround came to my house, for example. Okay. Yeah. How? How? Okay. And a genuine question, because obviously you you were only fourteen, fifteen at this point. How did you feel being interviewed by Sky and BBC? Yeah, I mean, it was it was quite a, a change from uh, like telling my friends about it to, you know, telling the world about it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I think, I think, um, yeah, initially I, I just like sort of took it all in and I was like just living in the moment. Um, and, uh, yeah, just embraced it all really. Uh, because yeah, once you get that kind of traction, it's, it's like, just go ahead and, and do it. Uh, and that's why, like, I think, especially for startups, like the, the best thing to always do is just grasp like the lowest hanging fruit, um early on because that's something that could lead to something more if that makes sense like i found my co-founder for example through the, the sky news uh interview like he reached out to me on twitter and i started talking with him from there so uh yeah always always just you know build traction where where you can even whether it's through media or whether it's through i don't know like small gigs um, you can always boost your startup in in these kind of ways. Of course, take full full advantage of every single opportunity that comes along. And you you mentioned your co-founder. Yeah. Uh, it was it was Nikhil, right? Or uh, yeah, so that's Nikhil joined later on. But the the first co-founder I had was uh, Dovi. Oh, uh, Dovi, Dovi yeah. does. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah, okay. yeah. So uh, with Dovi, yeah, he was a he's a web developer. So previously he worked on some other projects, and uh, he's actually fairly young as well. He's actually turning eighteen this year. Um, and uh, with him, for example. Yeah, we just started off. Uh, I mean, I 
built the app, of course, but I needed a web dashboard as well. Mm-hmm. And I had no clue on how I could create web dashboards. I mean, I, I know, you know, HTML and CSS, like everyone else does, but, uh, you know, there was like some other languages like PHP, FreeJS. Uh, so with Dovey, he had all the expertise there and we said, okay, why not? Uh, let's just collaborate. Uh, and yeah, that, that really did boost. I, I guess that was the first step from becoming a project to a startup, mm. I'd say. Um, of course. It's when, as soon as you start filling those or plugging those gaps where you have a lack of knowledge, then it starts becoming a fully fledged, I suppose, company idea, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so what, what I exactly. found quite, quite impressive as well was, um, and this is why I was asking you how you felt about uh, being interviewed by Sky News and BBC, because you're, you're like, yeah. even now, three years into you know, your business and your vision, I guess, you're incredibly humble. And I got, I, I got that impression, especially when you were be, you'll be, right. had that little interview at the, uh, I can't remember who gave it, gave the interview, but the, it was at the BIS. And what I, what I, what I could, I, I garnered from you was that you, you're kind of, you're living for this vision that's essentially bigger than yourself, which is incredible. Yeah. What what is explain to me like your vision for our way and I suppose I suppose your 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 approach to business I guess. Yeah, sure. I mean, um the greater vision we have is uh yeah, being able to like have this sort of centimeter accurate uh positioning system uh, deployed across the world. And uh the way we want to achieve that is is through allowing all these different other companies and, and use cases to deploy it. So uh, essentially what we built is the core technology of being able to understand where someone is uh, through their mobile phone, through their like uh, camera uh, to a centimeter accuracy. And that single technology we want to deploy across all these use cases. So we looked at retail, uh, we looked at travel like uh, in airports and, and also in train stations um, and we're also exploring uh, projects with government. So just recently, um, we go into uh, Textiles. And with Textiles, it's, it's, uh, we go into their Allied Space Accelerator program. And with that program, uh, we're going to have the opportunity to actually collaborate with some of the, uh, like, for example, the U.S. Air Force and some other uh, governments. Um, and that one, like, like, we just need one pilot to really just prove ourselves uh, with, with how scalable this kind of thing is. Uh, because solutions for indoor positioning so far have just relied on hardware. And uh, the problem with hardware is it's just unscalable. And, and so right now, if you go into... Yeah, yeah. If you if you went into your local uh, shopping mall, you would probably never find a, a navigation or, or, you know, positioning app. Or Google Maps, for example, doesn't even work in, so, uh, like, indoor... indoor uh, uh, in, in those, like, kind of malls. So... Uh, essentially, what we want to do is is enable all these indoor spaces to be uh, covered by our system and uh, mapped out. So we have this digital twin. That's amazing. So yeah, a few buzzwords there, but yeah, I mean that's essentially our, our vision. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fantastic. Um, and because also from that 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 perspective, you um, I j- just move slightly away because you've also been heavily influenced by Pointer as well. Uh, didn't Axel from Pointer end up? mentoring you to a certain extent or at least uh yeah yeah so actually uh with axel and, and there was also Ege, uh who's the ceo of pointer um and, and they're doing some really awesome stuff now with beacon tech um yeah i mean initially again once we were still at that project phase uh i straight away went to them and uh wanted to say okay can i use your technology to build what i want to build and uh, yeah, we started doing some some work and uh, prototyping uh, prototyping some solutions together. But ultimately, I realized that I wanted to create my own core technology. And um, you know, they were doing some computer vision stuff, but not to the level that I wanted to go. Uh, so yeah, essentially, um, around 2018, 2019, we continue working. I mean, the, the mentor and support I got from them was amazing. Um, it literally opened the door into the startups for me. Um, you know, and, and, you know, showed me how this whole industry operates. And, uh, yeah, after that, I decided in, in like 2019, uh, second quarter, uh, let me branch out and, uh, just start building something of my own. And that's when we brought on, uh, and I connected with Nickel, who's actually our other co-founder and, uh, he's like the XR specialist. So he's actually a published researcher as well in this whole space. Uh, so his expertise, uh, really boosted us, uh, to, to create and, and sort of, map out how we're going to build this uh technology that's cool mate and 
I was going to ask as well. Uh, so, so yeah, just just um, so just branching off from that. Obviously, yeah, you you're, uh, you know, points have really helped you out, and you were able to reach out to Axel. I'm pretty sure you you sent him an, sent him an email, and from what I read, he was very impressed by you know this 14 year old setting up his own business and having this amazing vision. Um, what would you say is do you, what would you say from the point of view of someone who's been mentored um, to I don't know other under 18s or young entrepreneurs out there? Yeah. Do you reckon? Uh, do you think? Me- being mentored is incredibly important or do you reckon there could be different approaches yeah i mean i think it's it's the single most important thing um you know any young founder or even any founder could just make as a first step to getting into a new industry or or, you know getting into that field uh that one single email that i wrote and uh, again like i wrote this email to a bunch of companies um and and you know you usually find all their emails online uh, you know, that single email that I wrote maybe in, in like, you know, 20, 30 minutes uh, really did transform everything. I mean, if, if I didn't go through that phase of trying to reach out and ask for help and support early on, um, I would have had made all the mistakes and, and you know, gone through all of that process, probably, uh, uh, you know, an, like with an extra year or something, you know, it would have really delayed everything. So that's why having that mental support and, and going for them so I could like just say, oh, I've got this question. How do I do this? Uh, you know, I how do I sell this? How do I position my product in the market? How do I do that? I mean, all those kind of questions and, and that kind of support that um, these mentors provide is is super valuable. And it's like, you know, with entrepreneurs, especially it's it's a give back mentality. So I think people shouldn't be embarrassed or like afraid of just reaching out to your favorite founder. I mean, on Twitter, especially like Twitter, LinkedIn, you could reach these guys super easily. Like uh, just tweet them, just reply to their tweet, get their attention and then slowly but surely build that relationship out and start communicating with them. And one day they might just, you know, turn into your uh, mentor. Uh, So like, for example, with Elon Musk, let's say, um, you know, how many degrees are you away from connecting to Elon Musk? Like maybe you connect to uh, the head of SpaceX or something, or like, you know, some, some engineer there, and then he connects you with someone else and then it goes to him. So uh, really we are all connected. It's just about realizing um, the power of like just emailing them or, you know, tweeting them or, Sending the sending them a LinkedIn request. Yeah, absolutely. It's all about just taking that leap. And the inter- interesting thing about yeah. mentorship, I was um, having this conversation with a chap called Nick Roma, who um, runs an interior design company up in Dundee called Verge Verge ID. Oh. And um, his his interesting approach to mentorship, or I, don't know, I suppose business coaching, was that you yeah. have to do it in stages as well. Because right right now you've obviously been you know mentored by pointer to a certain extent and they've been able to get you to a certain level um and what nick was saying was that um you know he grew his business from zero to five hundred thousand by taking on a mentor who had done exactly the same thing and then yeah from 500 to a million based on what another uh, based purely on taking on another mentor who'd done exactly the same thing and it keeps changing mentors based on what he wants yeah. to achieve. So that, that's a very, very powerful thing about mentoring, which um, I think a lot of people undervalue. And other people have, yeah. I think... I think. And how easy it is just to, to get started with, like, you know, even forget what stage you're at. If you just, you know, position yourself and say, oh, yeah, I'm start, I want to become a founder. Um, and then just reach out to one of these guys and say, oh, I've got some questions. I've got some concerns. Um, they will re- reply in some capacity for sure. Oh, of course, uh, and people and people really under, yeah. un- underestimate the the well, general human decency. People always like to yeah. give advice, and if you just request it, they'll more often than not just respond to you. Obviously, you're not going to be able to all the time contact Elon directly and get an immediate response. Yeah, yeah, but of course. <laughs> you never know. You keep plugging away, you might be able to get somewhere. But I think there's uh, there's a lot to be said about. I wouldn't say people um, like indiv- individual founders arrogance, but I think there's certainly this element um, and requirement to be independent and to uh, to be truly self made, which yeah. often is a little bit of um, I think I think it's a bit of an issue because they often are a bit more reluctant to take on mentors. But I think you have to give you know part part of that part of yourself away it's like taking on a new team and knowing when to delegate tasks and not to be too proud to you know 
know when you're not good enough to say, I don't know, do certain elements of marketing or realize that you're really shit at sales. <laughs> you just need to yeah. bring someone on. Um, so I, exactly. I think that's, that it's important. So it's, I'm, I'm glad you said that, especially because it's quite, it's, it's quite important for young founders to know that they just need to give it a go. Just reach out to yeah. people and see what happens. Because And down the line, those relationships are going to be super useful. Um, I mean, just from my own experience, I mean, you know, we, we had... Uh, like literally just now, we, you know, one of my mentors said, oh, I've got this uh, residential um, real estate project uh, that, you know, I'd love for you to work on. And, and just from, you know, talking to him, you know, just starting the relationship, what, a few months ago, um, you know, we're going to, to land another uh, five-figure contract, which is just amazing. So I think just those small connections um, just do, and, and building a relationship is the most important part. Like just, you know, treating them more than just someone you can get from and and you know just having that sort of uh, relationship of okay um i ask you questions and maybe i can also help you with other stuff or i can contribute something it, initially like maybe a, a creative way to reach someone would be okay uh, i can help you design something i could just do some free work for you and and that will get my foot through the door at least uh, have you have and, you done that yeah. yourself uh yeah yeah a few ways so like um you know, one thing I've done is, uh, so like with Pointer Labs, for example, I did send them in the email, of course, my white paper and my idea and everything, but um, I also kind of like gave them advice on how they could, uh, you know, position their tech and, and do more. I mean, it was kind of arrogant for me to just say that in an email, but uh, it kind of did go through and, and you know, it got their attention. So uh, yeah, and I, I think I tweeted them as well. I, I, just, I did everything I could just to get their attention because at that point they were like the leading uh sort of positioning company in london yeah um it, that, it, it kind of just reminded me of something there yes you, you might be giving them a little bit of advice on how to improve their business and uh, i imagine when they see this 14 year old giving them yeah. some consultation they're just like what but you must have impressed them it, it kind of it made me hark back to that see have you <laughs> seen have you seen wolf of wall street yeah, of course. I think everyone has. Yeah, Come on. <laughs> I got. I got. I got to ask these questions. You know, when Jordan Belfort he gets through his interview and he goes out for his um, his 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 liquid lunch with uh, Matthew McConaughey, and he he asks yeah. Leonardo DiCaprio, "Like, right, did I hear you pitch the stock in your interview?" And he's like, "Yeah, I did." It kind of just reminds me of that a little bit. It's just you've got to have that arrogance about you and yeah, to demonstrate exactly. your value to people. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to take you seriously. Yeah, and it's like, you know, you're, no one's going to remember you if you're just the other guy or you're like the 10 other guys in that same room. Um, and, and they must have had so many other project uh, proposals. I was like, you know, well, let me try and impress them. Let me just uh, do something that's more than anyone else. Oh, yeah. Well, you've done incredibly well so far. So just moving on to obviously a little bit more about, you know, your customer acquisition strategy, because... Essentially, sure. you've um, I've, I've had a look at I've had a look at the demo. I've had a look at the platform. It looks incredibly user friendly. I love the fact that um, our way as an app as well works offline. And <laughs> you got the Amer- yeah. you got the American lady doing the uh, voiceover as well. All oh, right, yeah, yeah, from Fiverr actually. <laughs> Is that from Fiverr, yes. Baby. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No more than five or ten dollars, mate. Gotta love Fiverr, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so what? Uh, so how, how does it actually work? How have you gone about um, approaching businesses? I know you, you've touched upon it so far a little bit. Um, sure. I, I did read that, obviously, a, a HCG, the um, the cancer hospital in um, uh, in Bangalore, was that your first? Yeah. That was your first implementation, obviously. And w- were you doing that free of charge? Yeah. Or what was the what was the strategy there? Yeah. So, so firstly, it sort of as a pilot. Uh, so we did it free of charge. But uh, yeah, then we moved into a contract with them. Um, to like cover that one hospital and like just before the whole COVID situation we were actually looking to expand that to cover like more of their hospital chains um, all around uh, India so you know that that was like our first uh, again like sort of uh, real world experience with how to work with a client and and, you know how to customize it Uh, and so they saw the, the proposition like the value proposition really early on uh, with how you know the tech works and and basically how it can help their uh, you know customers, uh, so like the patients and and even the employees who are using it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, in terms of our customer acquisition cost, so like just to touch up more on the business model. Uh, so yeah, we have a SaaS model where we work with these uh, you know large spaces 
Um, again, we have two streams where we ha uh, like go through. So we have a direct model, and then we also have the uh, channel partner model where we give them our SDK. So the direct model is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, we directly work with some of these uh, shopping malls or, or you know, what we worked recently with Transport for Wales. Um, and directly, we just approach them and uh, yeah, we set up a, a project and, and uh, yeah, like a 12-month contract is all our minimum. And who does the approaching? So, is that yourself or have you got someone else managing that aspect? Yeah, so, so it's myself. I mean, it used to be myself mainly since last year, but uh, we recently onboarded a growth lead uh damien um so yeah like our growth lead he, he's pretty uh ex he's much more experienced than everyone else in the team um so he actually exited his, his previous company open go for a billion dollars um like literally in in 2018 and then he worked with another startup since so uh yeah yeah he's he's like a marketing growth hacking person um but yeah so how the process works is I go uh, approach them, you know, of course, the usual sales process. And uh, yeah, the, the basis is we uh, set up like a 12 month contract and they uh, pay us uh, on a monthly basis. Um, and what we do is we just cover the whole uh, the place. So we give them a mapping up, we map out the whole place. And uh, we also have the SDK where we customize it. So we can, you know, let's say like for a small project, we have templates. So we literally just add their logo, maybe change up some of the colors, and now they have their own navigation solution. Um, so we've built it in a very, very like low touch integration way, um, so that it's like completely standalone. They don't need to do anything else. They don't need to worry about getting their IT people involved, um, and and that's what a lot of the businesses appreciate. It's literally just full end to end. Um, we do everything for them and uh, they just need to provide us their logos. And uh, yeah, that's really uh, amazing. So uh, the and on the channel partner method. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. No, you carry on. Yeah, yeah, sure. So on the channel partner method, we just, you know, give uh, other companies, usually AR studios and development teams, uh, our SDK and they integrate it into an existing app they might have or any new projects that they're building. I see. Uh, and, and yeah, we leave them to it. Right. Well, so when you mentioned channel partner model, I thought you meant um, essentially you'd be giving the SDK for or it, it would just be you'd be giving it to a, a reseller or they'd be packaging your product and then just adding on a little bit of margin and then they'd have a big sales team to essentially go out to different places. But I imagine it's, it's – I wouldn't say it's um, particularly – well, maybe it is. It's a complicated sell insofar as there is yeah. a, there is a big problem, a massive solution. And you touched upon it again when you were mentioning, obviously, the benefits to hospitals, for instance. Um, one thing that I would never have thought about is that the amount of time and money that is therefore spent by nurses not stopping and giving directions to people in the hospital. Literally, yeah, wouldn't think about exactly. it. But I think you found out about that only after the initial implementation with MHG. Uh, um, HTG. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, we literally, I, I had no clue what the, I mean, of course, I, I thought of the value proposition in, in a hospital, you know, oh, sure, it helps people, but I really didn't know the exact problem. So that small pilot we did really gave us insight. And we also interviewed the doctor um, himself who contacted us. Um, so we actually, like, uh, like for example, Nickel, our uh, CPO, he's based in uh, Bangalore. So he really maintained this relationship with the doctor and, and HTG Hospital. Um, and, and, Really, we sell the pilot just to, to test the product more than the business case. Uh, we wanted to do some serious testing, get some users involved. Um, so once we had that sorted, um, I think, yeah, we, we ran it for like a month. Um, and we had like a few weeks of negotiation. And uh, yeah, deploy the contract there That's awesome. um, and you know set it up fully. That's really cool. And, and, and so how did the hospital end up promoting it to obviously all the patients, everything that is that something that you guys get involved in or what's the process there? Yeah, sure. Uh, so like with a pilot, what we tested first was setting up banners and like some uh, posters and just some, uh, I guess like, you know, usual stuff to, to sort of get people to download the app at the entrances or, or you know, just start using it. Um, so, so again, at that point we were only an app, Based solution. Um, so right now we have like a web-based solution. I'll get to it in a bit, but uh, yeah, we had the banners to incentivize people to download it, and then afterwards we just let the the hospital themselves uh, start using it. Um, so like they set up their own banners and, and pushed it themselves. Uh, but right now the app is actually more used frequently between like the um, junior doctors as well. 
So, like again, like a lot of the elderly uh, patients or, or you know visitors don't really interact with it, but uh, a lot of the young junior staff uh, who want to you know find their way around to their new uh, wards, etc., uh, get to use it. And we have a two D map, so it's like the AR is one part, but of course we do provide like a two D map, so it's like you know standard for for you know all the other devices. Okay, and um, so in essence, what what kind of things did, were you try, trialing out then? You, you you said you were trialing banners, obviously upon entry, things like that. And did you see did you see within that first month of testing quite an upsurge in the amount of people that were downloading the app? Yeah, so uh, we had like a in, in the first like pilot, we had just a test flight link. Um, so what that means is we just sent people the link that we wanted to uh, wanted them to use, um, and then afterwards we once we pushed it publicly uh that's when um yeah the banners did help out a lot but again it's like it's not really dependent on on just the banners and and you know if people download it because they see the banner um so so like we saw that actually people did download it and and the people who did download it were really using it frequently and actively uh every time they went and visited the the uh, hospital like especially doctors like going there every day to to find new rooms etc um but the app wasn't, I mean, the app download process is a clunky process. So like actually getting someone to download it, go on the app store, search your name or, or go on the QR code and press download um, it is really a slowdown. So that's why uh, so far what we've done, uh, so that was in 2019 and fast forward to now, um, we've worked on a web-based solution. So uh, now it's not just an app, but it's actually accessible on any Safari or, or you know web browser on your phone. So literally with one web link, you can access this whole experience. Right. Um, and we've, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're still really working on it, and like that's why we've you know done some uh, raised like some funding as well. But uh, yeah, I mean, if we can get that really up and running, uh, I think that's going to really like just revolutionize how people actually interact with it and how easy it is to pick up. Since in my own experience, I never downloaded Google Maps. Like I first always use it on Safari. And then once I found it useful, it's kind of like a sales funnel. I then downloaded yeah. Google Maps after seeing the value behind it. Yeah. Exactly. You have to have a proof of concept in place. Yeah, that's so interesting. Because there are, yeah, there's such there's such a huge couple of steps before uh, you know, downloading an app. So yeah, it's, it's interesting that you've gone for the web. And have you, have you found the... Um, have you found? Did you find the development of the actual the the web version? Is it is it is it, is yep. it, is it quite seamless? Like in terms of uh, in terms of the quality of the app and usability? Yeah. Again, like there's certain things you can't do on the web, but you know we just came to accept. Okay, we want to get people from A to B, and of course provide some sort of experience uh, along the way. But the the main functionality is just let's get someone from A to B and make it. A very easy to use tool. Um, so we cut out a lot of like the voice n navigation feature in the web version. We cut out um, a lot of the other like menus that we had, like settings tab. Uh, so it was literally just purely navigation, uh, like a two D map of the hospital. And uh, yeah, we we had it on the their sub like on the their domain name. So it was like as their own experience. Um, and we just found it was way more uh, accessible for their own uh, patients and stuff. So. Uh, yeah, it ultimately ended up working really well for us. Oh, that's really cool. Like, make that pivot to, to web. Yeah, exactly. for sure, for sure. And then it's just it's, it's pure accessibility as well. And obviously, in terms of those uh, slightly older users who are haven't quite got the um, familiarity with downloading apps, this is a little bit more simplistic for them. And I, I did notice as well, yeah. you've got um, a certain element of access control integration in there as well, insofar as you've got ID cards and privileges for staff members. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we started working some more on, like, the staff tracking and, and how we could benefit more of the, the actual employees themselves instead of just the... Because, ultimately, they were the first users we had. Uh, they were the first to really test it and, and actively use it. So we said, okay, how could we benefit them some more? Like, maybe we can add some, some ID cards. And it isn't a very high-tech or anything like that. It, it's literally just a very simple 
um, system where we just assign each of the employees uh, the you know just like a database their names you know uh, their unique ID numbers and um, that way we can track them on the platform um, and uh, yeah we could have all that information available <clears throat> and again like we're looking at other stuff to do with that but uh, yeah being very low tech is also a good uh, thing to do like uh, of course like early on we were like oh let's build this super futuristic stuff but in reality a lot of the low tech like very simple just a database uh stuff is appreciated as well oh, very much so, um, so yeah. it's, a, it's a very and, and especially for mvps yeah, yeah. yeah well i'm just going to say it's just a, it's a very steep learning curve otherwise and if you've got all the bells and whistles then it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna mean that the take up of the app and the actual learning process is going to be a lot longer and uh, people often um often get disillusioned when there's too many things going on in one single app or one single web page, if it's too complicated for them, then you, you end up yeah. seeing it's less likely they're going to continue using it. Exactly. I mean, how many people use Facebook now? I mean, the, the new generations, like I don't use Facebook or right, just ads, know. just ads for it, me, just, mate. <laughs> I see it too complicated. Yeah. Yeah. I see it just as a very complicated thing. That's like, you know, communities, you can share stuff as games. I mean, yeah. Uh, but be, when, when Facebook first came along, I think I, I was, I was, I think I met one of, one of my first girlfriends at university playing Scrabulous with her on Facebook, which, <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And it, but it was amazing. You had Facebook nice. chat, you had all, all, all these little, you know, all these little bits and pieces, but then you've got the more simplistic apps like Instagram, which is just photos and sharing. And now you've got the added videos and everything like that, or TikTok. Oh yeah. my good God. Don't even get me started on that. I mean, that's, that's totally lost on me, man. I mean, it's going to explode, yeah. but the, all of these apps. Oh, and when, um, what was it? Do you remember, do you remember Vines? Yeah, Vine. That was very big. It was a six-second video that obviously I think it was there. They ended up getting bought out by Twitter essentially, but that that I think that was more of a bit of a phase, wasn't it? Um, but all of these yeah. things just cut through all the crap, and they're all, all very um, they're all they're all very two-dimensional in their thinking, and that's what yeah. attracts people. It just has to be simplistic, exactly. And on 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 message. But 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 here's the thing, though, right? Like. Again, in the Western world, we really appreciate that, like the simplicity. I mean, Steve Jobs, iPhone, I mean, that's where I think it evolved from. But we appreciate that. But when I went to Taiwan, personally, um, in Asia, it's very different. Like literally, Super these apps. guys love. Yeah, yeah, they, they love QR codes, for example. So that like, you know, I, I see QR codes on these tiny posters um, where they have all this information and it's all cramped together. But I guess that's more appreciated there. Um so yeah, I don't know. I mean, simplicity is is great here, but like, in that's why we we sort of saw Taiwan as like a test market for us to just roll something out. Since again, Asia is a really early adopter of new tech. So as soon as we rolled it out there, um, they started using it, and and I guess like their customers got it more than if we were to push something straight away in, in the UK. Um, and and that's why we use the traction and and all the demos and videos we got from Taiwan to uh, take that and uh, show it as sort of testimonials for our newer clients. That's really smart, mate. That's really smart. I, yeah, you, you never think of it that way because, you know, especially people in the West, that they um, often don't think about how, how easy it is to actually get something potentially POC'd in East Asia. And especially, as you mentioned, QR codes. Yeah. QR technology is just so undervalued over here um, and so underused. And yeah. it's, it's not popular. You know, the accessibility that QR technology has been able to provide Southeast Asian countries or East Asian in general, like, for instance, your little banana trader on the side of the road can have a QR code and then you'd be yeah. able to make a direct payment to her rather than, you know, paying in cash. It's They're essentially going to be a cashless society sooner than I reckon the West. Yeah, I mean, Google Pay in India is, I think, the, the biggest thing. Like, literally, I mean, just from my experience working with, with uh, some interns and, and whatnot over there, it's it's just like they use Google Pay for literally everything. Um, and I think we don't really have that kind of culture here. I mean, again, like uh, like newer generations are really using it and, and, you know, Apple Pay and whatnot, but uh, you don't see QR codes like everywhere, if that makes sense, like at malls or like really ca uh, cramped areas. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I think if a if, uh, founder wants to like build some really futuristic tech, like cryptocurrency, for example, those like small markets are really good uh, test markets to just validate ideas and concepts. Yeah. Um, so I, I think one of those, uh, one of the um, like African countries actually uh, had like a, a, you know, like the, I think the currency collapsed or something. And actually they started using cryptocurrency to, to 
Yeah, I think which country was it Zimbabwe? I can't remember. Zimbabwe, I think. I don't know. Yeah, but but they started using it, and, and literally now everyone's I think is is still using mobile payments and like uh, crypto, which is just crazy. I mean, I I just think like uh, it's the best thing to do is yeah, just build a POC. Um, and just take it somewhere, and and it's it's quite easy too. If it's a software product, it's it's very easy to yeah, do. Um, yeah, yeah. Because most people know English, like especially those other companies in East Asia, at least. Generally, yeah. I mean, um, because uh, I I kicked off a small business in Cambodia um, about a year wow. ago. No well to it, mate. Uh, <laughs> it was all right. Oh. Uh, it was uh, myself and co-founder who's uh, he was he's a, he's a developer. I had a team in India as well, and it was a POS business. Um, but it was it was amazing because uh, Phnom Penh is, is home to a lot of Americans and English and French as well. I've I, I have the good fortune of being able to speak a second language, so I was able to speak to them. Wow, which is quite, yeah, it's cool. It's very all, fortunate. CMOs like all, all growth leads actually uh, French. Ah oui, to, to mention, très bien. So, yeah, <laughs> and we'll stop there. <laughs> stop there um but it was um it, it was it was it was very illuminating like starting a business in a, in, a, in a country which is so it's so vastly different than over here i think unfortunately we went in with yeah. a slightly different proposition our, our our technology was cool as hell all android and um and uh well, it's all uh, it's all tablet based. Essentially, the the idea around our POS system was it worked offline. We had our own own intranet essentially. So when there was an internet, wow. when there was a power shortage, or the internet or the Wi-Fi went down, which is a regularity in Cambodia, then our POS wow. system would continue to work offline essentially. So it's a sit proposition. Issue was one, pricing, and two, we didn't have enough bells and whistles for the. Uh, for the French and English customers who are too used to POS systems back in the West, who are significantly more advanced, and obviously the pricing kind of right. priced out the Cambodians. So we're in a bit of a pickle, unfortunately. But it's a really, really cool yeah. experience. And um, it's funny you mentioned. I think we we were going to look into doing something around along the crypto, uh, the, the the crypto approach as well. How it was going to work, no idea. Mm. But um, we did have some ideas. But um, it didn't didn't Venezuela off the back of obviously. You know, horrendous collapse. They were looking at um, kicking off. Uh, I think they started using crypto as well. They, I think they were coming out with a nas- yeah. national crypto, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, again, like those smaller countries, the, the way they develop and um, the way they can just pick up, because like, right now, what, what's a Venezuelan dollar worth, for example? You know, so hyperinflation that, would suggest uh, exactly. Yeah. So, so that entirely killed the economy. So. Adopting new tech like blockchain can really, really change it. And I think that they've really seen success through that. Um, you know, like right now, uh, they're still using it, I believe so. But uh, yeah, I think I think the Western world will like slowly, like maybe in the next five to 10 years, that's when we'll start to really see crypto being picked up. I mean, there, there is adoption happening now. It's just we don't really see it. Um, it's not in the media. It's not like, oh, you know, PayPal's now accepting Bitcoin or something. Uh, but it's slowly starting to move up and um be adopted i'd say by like the, the big corporates as well mm. and uh, definitely noticed at least so is yeah. um still lumens isn't that ibm's yeah so they had some partnership was it might be god it's been a while since i've looked into the crypto game but um yeah no but it's, it's all gone down that's why the <laughs> you know everyone's dumped it right now well, it's like facebook's libra as well and i think um didn't didn't they uh, didn't, didn't didn't the European Union uh, mention they were going to come out with their own Euro supranational cryptocurrency as well? Wow. Absolutely, absolutely. I massive. mean, I just remember 2017 going through the whole ICO rush and you know seeing millions just traveling in and out and uh, being stolen, I mean, <laughs> and then just being anyone lost. could do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's untraceable. So just start an ICO, you know make a fake team and that's it like in a few months you just raise yeah, the scam coins were to a penny weren't they and then as soon as bitcoin yeah. hit its height at 20 grand and started plummeting that's when more and more people just kept on throwing money away and losing and losing yeah. and losing um i don't i don't know I, I i find i find the whole adoption of cryptocurrency um very interesting simply from the point of view is of how how is it going to be able to bypass national currencies? Even though, yeah. even if the big corporates do end up 
take taking on. I mean, government intervention is going to be massive. And that was one of the issues we had in Cambodia as well, because they there was absolutely no way that Hun Sen would have allowed any form of crypto to be introduced into the current into the country without having you know, full government control over wow. it. Um, the only place really. That, so, so they've got like a real ban on crypto? Uh, I haven't checked recently, but at that time, so approximately a year ago, they def- they did. They did a bit a bit longer than a year ago. I think, I think what they are trying to do, however, they're trying to introduce a new smart city into Phnom Penh. And that will, okay. that, I think that's all based on DLT as well. So I think after that, they're going to have a crypto of sorts. And, but yeah. I imagine there'll be, you know, a full, full amount of government control over it. Unlike Thailand, yeah. Thailand has uh, is very very open to cryptocurrency, but again, there seems to be there seems to be a very uh, a nationalist agenda um, at the moment over there. So I'm not entirely sure how that's oh. working out. But Bitcoin, like uh, Bitcoin trading, is massive over there. There's a lot of crypto co- uh, crypto companies over there as well. So it's it is it yeah. isn't it's a very interesting place, Southeast Asia, to start a business. It's all very exciting. Yeah, and very high tech as well. I mean, there's a lot of pioneering startups there. Have you been to Singapore Uh, yet? No, I mean, I definitely want to go there. Yeah, I never got the chance, man. I would love to go there. And I still haven't been to Bali. You find a lot of crypto startups in Bali as well. Bali? Yeah, Yeah, beautiful location as well. Lots of expats. Love to spend some time there. I only only did Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos and Thailand. But yeah, God, the whole, it's such a beautiful place as well. Anyway, I digress. Let's yeah. not get into how beautiful the place is. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> um, what was I sure. going to say? So, just heading, 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 um, heading back to our way. So, you went through a little rebranding process in was it 2019? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I think it was yeah 2018, 2019. Um, we just changed the name really, uh, just because again it wasn't a really like it was a system there. I mean, I, I think when I registered the company, I was literally just I was like, I, I don't know what to call it. Let me just call it iMarek. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, at that time, I was never really a marketing or like a, a branding kind of guy. That's cool. um, I just focused on the on the tech, and that's why uh, when we shifted to our way, which was more of like a you know, okay, you get it, you know, it sounds cool, uh, it has some sort of meaning. People can like understand the deeper meaning Very of it, like AR as well. Way. Very easy to search and type. It's, it's yeah, it's five letters, mate. Exactly. So, so yeah. I mean, I, I just came up with it, and I said, "Oh, let's stick with it." Oh, you um, came up with our way. You didn't. And... It wasn't. It wasn't like it wasn't the growth lead. No, no, no. I mean, Damien joined literally uh, in February, oh, really? so he he joined very oh, very recently. fresh. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, so that's why you know this year the the plan is to really boost um, our operations, just because we now have someone who's like done thirty. Uh, like, I mean, I can tell you some of our numbers right now. Like, we're doing twenty leads uh, literally every day now. And uh, this is just all the automation stuff. That he, yeah, just from just from uh, Damien's uh, automation systems. So he he's like a crazy growth hacker in this space. And um, yeah, I, I've personally just like been in awe of the work he's been doing. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean it's it's really cool stuff. But can you yeah, just to, to go back. Oh, you're about to yeah, go yeah, back. Right. But just to interject, what kind of can you can you give us an insight into any tips or tricks that Damien's using? Yeah, sure. So again, there's a. F- few different tools but um the the most powerful thing to leverage is probably linkedin so that's where we mainly source all our leads through and there's like a few different tools like phantom buster for example that uh he's mainly been using right now where you can set up like a whole whole automation pipeline and uh yeah we also have pipe drive where we just like you know process all the leads we have like a, a system where we run them through we you know have contact made there's a meeting scheduled uh, if there's uh, you know m- more further interest negotiations, yeah, trusty CRM closed, system, etc. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, so the the great part is he's automating the whole reach out process um, and just going through. Okay, how do you reach new clients? How do you reach uh, new new prospects? Actually, uh, just to touch on that. So, um, with some of the da- that stuff Damien's been doing, like I actually created like a mini crash course as well in how founders can uh, basically. Uh, automate their investor reach out process because right now like a lot of the networking events uh, where that's where you mainly source investors from are closed and even the online pitches aren't that interactive so uh, using LinkedIn what I've done is just sell uh, literally less than two hours like a very mini course on how you can um, use some of these other tools and just automate the whole process like basically um, in, in my experience 
we closed our funding round while well, we're about to close it uh, by just finding some angels on LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, literally, I automated the whole process of reaching them. So like, yeah. I had a, a, a messaging thing. I, I like there was a few tools I used and, and uh, I just went for a list of 600 investors. And overnight, I just left my computer running for like three days. And uh, it just uh, yeah, basically scraped through all their profiles and sent them messages like all personalized as well. And uh, yeah, from there, surprisingly, I what was it? It was like I reached a hundred investors. Um, Fifty were interested. You know, then ten only. Then it was like ten who were actually committed to to you know setting up a second meeting. And uh, right now, it's only a few that were were in discussions for a negotiation. But um, that pipeline is is yeah, like that's what we built. And and Bill Gates has a very famous quote actually on this, where he said, "It's all a number game, right?" Uh, averages. You're reaching out to investors. Yeah, exactly. You know, what was it? He reached out to a, uh, what, like a thousand people to to invest in Microsoft to start off with. And uh, only, well, like one person like actually invested. And and surprisingly, Microsoft only raised one round. They, I think they only raised a seed round for like a million or two million. And that's it. Remarkable. So it's really just a numbers game. And that's why, uh, yeah, automating it really just changed everything for me. Cause like previously I was just using LinkedIn in the, the, the most basic capacity. <laughs> and, and, uh, I was like, you know, instead of selling my service, let me sell my startup to investors who, who would be interested and like specific UK X angel, uh, X founder startups, uh, sorry, uh, you know, angel investors. So yeah. and then you'll have enough money to be able to uh, spend 50 pound a month on uh, sales navigator on LinkedIn always help yeah yeah exactly <laughs> so we, we're cool. just using the basic package then we're we using sales navigator at all no no i mean i still don't use sales navigator i i that whole automation stuff is just like a uh, linkedin helper is one of the tools used in the in the course but um literally through there i just reach out to all these different investors um and just like i actually pop like put the uh the database i personally used for free on my linkedin um but yeah i have like this 600 uh page sorry 600 uh, investor list and uh it's it's very focused just on uh uk investors who are also ex-founders and um yeah from there i just process uh all the in, all the investors go through all of them send them a personalized message if they're interested i add them to pipe drive and then send them like a automated email actually uh and so i have very very little interactions with mm-hmm. them but it, for them, on their side, it seems like I'm leading a full discussion with them. And, and so that way, it actually saves us time as founders, because I know fundraising is a very distracting process. Um, so yeah, I mean, that way I, I said, okay, let me take this, build a little course. Because like a few of my founder friends just requested it, and I was like, why not? And uh, yeah, I just decided to, to yeah just show how I've been able to succeed. And in, in, yeah, like right now where 60% of our funding round is closed, L 300 k um, so we're just like in a negotiations with a few other angels, but yeah, very soon we hope to to close the whole round. Um, probably in in like early summer, yeah. Okay. Uh, unless these, I don't know, unless like COVID round two comes over or something. <laughs> Don't yeah. tempt fate, mate. Don't tempt fate. And <laughs> I just, obviously, I, I'm glad that you've um, moved into finance, uh, to, to finance, because that's definitely something I kind of want, a, a big topic that is quite important yeah. and that I really wanted to touch upon. But just before I get into that, by the way, mate, um, if, if whilst you're generating leads to like LinkedIn and everything like that, I don't know if you're still, you are still doing it. Um, have you ever heard, heard of a tool called yeah. Lusher? Lusher? No. Uh, L-U-S-H-A. Um, it is, okay. it's a sent, it's a, it's a plugin that you can, uh, that, um, it's an independent plugin that basically scours the internet. And if you land on someone's profile on LinkedIn, it will scour the internet and try and identify any personal details for them. So like a mobile number or something the, like that. Yeah, exactly. That, that's one, not, I, I wasn't using that tool, but there was another one called link match, which I was using. Ah, okay. Well, I haven't heard of that one. So I'll definitely explore that one. Though. Yeah. But Lush- and, and that gives you a template as well. So like. Uh, if you connect with them, um, I think that's when you can actually get their personal email and their personal um, like number as well, and, and and also like their titles, their positions. Oh. Um, but yeah, and then from there, it's integrated to Pipe Drive. I add it in. I mean, I go through all of this stuff. So so like I'm teaching you to suck me, eggs here, man. I'll just uh, I'll pipe down over here. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, when I found out how all of this comes together, I was like blown away. Like uh, because. 
I mean, LinkedIn, who thought LinkedIn would be useful, right? Like everyone foils like an online CV. <laughs> um, Mate, it's fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I swear yeah. I swear by Sales Navigator, always have. Um, but yeah, heading back to the fi- financing. Awesome. So you have a 300K. So this is your first, this is your first round of investment, right? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Exactly. So 300K, why have you, what, why is that your milestone? Yeah, so we broke it down into like, um, okay, so we have like a financial model. And, and again, I really personally hate doing all the financial modeling stuff. But uh, the way we set it up is we broke it down into, okay, um, what's everyone's salary is going to be? Uh, what what kind of budget do we need for development? Like how many people do we need to hire uh, for in terms of developers? So we, we really did go into like the details of, of um, you know, the sort of developers we need and also setting up a, uh, correct contingency for development so again the the biggest problem for startups is burning cash super quickly and then just you know not having enough and and ending up with nothing basically or something half finished so we went into real details with okay how do we set up a development team in it in bangalore uh where we could actually um firstly like keep the developers on board because one of the biggest problems with out not outsourcing developers but like not doing development, let's say in London, is the developers in India can really like the, the mentality there is like always keep moving up and and you know move on to new positions. So uh, we had to find a, a good way to balance sort of the churn rate with development. So like, let me get into the advice I got. So I had some advice from from this other founder who's got like a massive team in India already, and he said uh, like the developers there literally there's two types so there's like the developers who aren't really qualified for the job they i mean sorry they're qualified but they can't really achieve the stuff you need to do and then the other developer is is you know really good but they're not really qualified or their profile's missing um so the best way to sort of go through this is uh setting up coding tests so uh what we've implemented is like these very simple tests where uh we usually ask like the uh, you know, any new senior developer that joined the team uh, to go through like a C++ or like a, a C sharp test. And uh, yeah, from there we assess how good they are. And if they score above 80, that's when we bring them in mm-hmm. because it, it's all about the coding proficiency. Um, and yeah, again, the contingency is like the biggest if factor there. Cause like, what if you hire, you know, I don't know, a team of 10 and, and six leave or, you know, eight leave uh, that's, what can really screw up uh, the whole operation? So, so how do you how, how do you identify doing... that they they've actually got longevity? Yeah, so so you can't really identify it to start with. You can only identify, it, I guess, over time. Um, so that's why we kind of assume in our financial model that like fifty percent of our developers will leave. So we actually made the assumption um, in our like sensitivity analysis that, okay, we're going to lose 50 developers. So let's have, sorry, like 50% of our developers. So let's have enough cash in the bank to support hiring new developers or like, you know, hiring maybe two people for one position. Um, so there's like a real process that like the first month you get them to, to, you know, they can make mistakes in the first month, but, uh, in the, in the next three months, uh, they need to, to start, you know, being aligned with a company and, and not make mistakes as often. And then I think, what was it? Month six is when you start to see if they take initiative on their own. So if, if they just work based on the tasks you give them and then stop, um, but they don't take any initiative on their own, let's say at like six months deep, then are they really the, the right match, like the right long-term developer that you want on your team? Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, you know, filtering through these kind of developers and, and seeing uh, who's really right. Like, do these guys actually align with the mission or is it just the money that they care about? Because, uh, yeah, Bangalore is like the Silicon Valley of yeah. India now. So uh, there's some really great developers, but you got to filter the, uh, and, and basically find those developers. And that, uh, all often in- so, yeah. that often entails obviously losing a bit of cash and going through a bit of yeah, a burn rate. Yeah, a a- I've heard founders who've cut like six months worth of work, like code, just throw it away, like burn through a hundred K with, without achieving anything and just restarting completely uh, because they don't have any processes in place. Um, so I think like when you get to a, a size of 10 or something, you start to get a manager involved. You start setting up cameras in the offices. 
I mean, like there's there's a lot to it. So even now, I'm still in the learning stage of all of this. Uh, I mean, you said you actually, Rowan, you you set up a, a development team as well in India. Uh, it wasn't well. my development uh, team; it was uh, it was my co-founder. So he'd he'd already been working with him on. Oh right. Yeah, they used to work on app development projects together. Um, and so they, they, cool. I think they'd been working together for six years or so. So yeah, my my knowledge of actually putting a team together is quite minimalistic, in all fairness. So yeah, this, this, Same. yeah, I, learning I still curve, feel like that. Uh, <laughs> learning curve, mate. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Oh, massive. Um, so obviously, whilst whilst you're obviously looking to raise 300k, you've had to come up with a valuation for your company in order to give away a certain amount of equity. What was your process around doing that? Yeah, so the valuation we determine. Okay, so so this is a big thing. I don't know if I've mentioned it. So we've actually received an acquisition on offer already. Yes, for I our, read like, that. Technology that was for team. one mil uh, from one of the bigger players in the market, who I don't know the name of, and I'm not sure if you're allowed to uh, disclose that information. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm under an NDA with them, but That's fine. yeah. Again, so we we received like an acquisition offer uh, from them, and we just set the valuation based on that. So we said, okay, um, they valued our company and our technology on this. Um, you know. We also see that our valuation, uh, based on the progress we've made so far, is this. So, so currently our pre-money valuation is two million, um, and with TechStars and and some of the other, um, you know, like the angels who will come on board, um, you know, they've like that once they actually, uh, once we actually take the money from them, like once it's cash in the bank, uh, since we've already signed everything, um, that's when the the actual official valuation of each share is going to be at that price point. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, it, it's, it's, uh, valuation is very hard early on because it's very easy to overvalue and then undervalue. Like, I mean, anyone would right now say, oh, I've got like a billion dollar business to start off with, right? Like I've got a billion dollar idea, but essentially when you're doing a company valuation, uh, you kind of need to like figure out, okay, what assets do I have? Is it, if it's code, if it's technology, it's very non, it's like untangible, so um, it's hard to assess the value of that. Uh, but maybe if you have got some like existing cl- uh, clients, maybe some some contracts in place. Um, so so little by little, you can start understanding your value. But I'd say for most startups, it would be um, you know at least over a million or over two million or like in that sort of range um, because you don't want to you know sell yourself short because uh, raising is a negotiation at the end of the day. Like some guy might say to you, "Oh, your business is value that only." Ten thousand pounds, and uh, you know, get shares like get own fifty percent of your business with five thousand. Or if you go to a VC, you can tell them, okay, we value ourselves at uh, four million, and actually, you're targeting two million. So they, you know, it's kind of like a negotiation. You know, like you kind of have to uh, keep budging it up. And and VCs do this a lot. They like say, oh, actually, we don't really believe in it too much. Um, we'll give you, you know, 100K a hundred k a a million valuation or something. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it is a really interesting process to go through, and I think you just learn it over time, just talking to investors. So uh, that's why it's really good to get no's from investors, just continuously get no's. So I, I mean, I've been trying to like, I've been pitching since last year even, uh, but not have you, really have seriously. You been, pitching. Have you been finding finding uh, pitching so far? It was a bit nerve wracking to begin with, or did you slowly? Yeah, I mean. To start off with, I mean, it's it's like to start off with. I try to explain everything in, in five minutes, like which is crazy in five minutes, you need to just get their attention. You don't need to, uh, you know, try and give them like why they're going to make their money back or, or, you know, why it's such a great business. You just need to get their attention so that they can follow up with you. And that's when you can go into the details. Um, so yeah, I, it's kind of like, you know, I guess pitching is kind of like <laughs> trying to find a, uh, talk to girls, for example, like you, you kind of like need to keep it low key, mysterious, get their attention and then start like developing out the whole relationship and, and uh, you know, go for, for those like 30 minute talks and everything. And uh, yeah, because it, you know, no one's going to write you a check on a napkin, for example, like usually it, it takes a few months for them to trust you as a founder and trust what you're doing. And, and, you know, that's why setting up a newsletter is very important as well. Uh, keeping them in the loop. Um, and, and that's why I've just been doing over the last few months, just focusing my energy on, you know, building up a pipeline and keeping everyone in the loop, taking feedback and uh, yeah, executing. And executing. Spoken like a true founder, my man. And can yeah. I just lastly ask you before we uh, finish up, why did you, I imagine you refused the acquisition offer. 
Yeah, so what we've actually done is we've turned it into a partnership. So um, we've shifted it and said, okay, uh, can we actually partner with you guys to provide you our technology and, uh, you know, like still continue to, to have that working relationship, um, but, you know, not with the acquisition going through. Uh, so that way, you know, both parties benefit and, uh, yeah, we can still continue building what we want to build. Excellent. And on that note, mate, I'm going to ask you to do two more things for me. Yeah, Are sure. Ready? So the first one, I need you to give me your best pitch for our way. Can you do that? Okay. All right, I'm going to give you yeah, sure. 10 to 15 seconds. <clears throat> ready, steady, go. Okay. Wait, so <laughs> how does it work again? So like, You've got you're... 10 to 15 seconds. Yeah. Elevator pitch me our way. Okay, great. Sure. Always building the Google Maps for the indoors. Look, we've already turned down an acquisition offer and we're on our way to build the next Google Maps. And uh, yeah, currently... Oh, crap. I mean, I've, <laughs> it's I haven't so, done so hard well. to do on the spot, mate. I didn't prepare you. Yeah, yeah. Let me... That's right. We'll go again. We'll go yeah, again. Me... Sure. When are you ready? Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. Yeah, our way is the Google Maps for the indoors. We're building an indoor AR navigation platform and we're changing the way people navigate uh, a to B. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Short, yeah, succinct. I, <laughs> I mean, usually, like, I've changed it. I mean, I, I went from that phase to like small pitches to now like sending emails and, <laughs> and sort of like explaining the traction. Oh, cool. Because yeah, I don't know. No, mate, it was elevated it was pitches. It was fine. It's very, it's very difficult to do. <laughs> I keep on catching people off guard by uh, by doing this. I'm a horrible person, mate. No, it's, but it's good practice because you never know who you're going to get caught in an elevator yeah. with. <laughs> um, and yeah, exactly. And number two, my man, um, would you mind getting your phone, turning around and taking a selfie yeah. with me in the background? Is that all right? Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> let's do this. I mean, I've got like a really thick phone case. Where I don't know if you've I noticed. Love it. Like when traveling, I just like, <laughs> I don't want to break Wait, it Indestructible, again. man. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> But let me let me get the other position. Let me see if I can get you in the. Oh, the lighting's messing up. <laughs> one second. <laughs> Orcs. I'm actually terrible at selfies. Uh, okay. That's not a bad thing, mate. <laughs> let me try that one more time. <laughs> I think the lighting's a little bad. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Great. Excellent. Thank Finally, you. we got we there. Did. We did. You've done excellently. Mate, thank you so much uh, for jumping on. It's been an absolute pleasure meeting you and having a conversation with you. Wish we could have actually probably have done yep. this in person, but obviously, you know, current situations do not permit. Yeah. And I must, like, a final note, I must say, like, I really do love the, the poster in the background that you have. Like, that's, <laughs> so I, that's the coolest thing ever. <laughs> I mean, how did you get that? I mean, can we go into like a like a interviewing Rowan about how he like set all Absolutely of Absolutely not. <laughs> no, this is mate, this is like twenty quid from Amazon, man. I wanted something. Oh. I wanted something, you know, a little bit. I feel like it, it would have a cool founding story. Oh, or something. Like, oh I, I brought it all the way from. No, you've got you've ended this in, interview on a down note, mate. Oh, no, nah, man, it was it was twenty quid from Amazon. I wanted something. So I'm basically, I've just moved to my new place uh, in Twickenham and oh, okay. it's, it's really chill and zen and I wanted something relatively kind of weird, psychedelic awesome. and zen in the background so I could feel a little bit more at home and that's, that's literally it. There's yeah. nothing more complicated to it. This is, this is really cool. I, I can definitely tell you right now, like this podcast is going to be like the, the, um, what's, what's the other one called? The, the super big one, like, oh, what, what's it called? Like, it's all the startup one, but. No, the the bald guy, and he interviewed Elon Musk as well. Oh, Joe Rogan. You must know. Yes, this is. I feel like this is going to be the next Joe Rogan because it's like it's. You've got everything there, like the, the whole vibe. And oh, I really appreciate that, man. Joe Rogan was definitely my my inspiration. I'm not going to lie. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's why I that guy's awesome, man. He's sick, isn't he? He's absolutely sick, mate. Let's let's put an end to this. And uh, we'll continue the conversation sure. afterwards. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Baron, for coming on board. I really, really appreciate it. Have you got anything, yeah. uh, really appreciate anything else to say to uh, my two or three listeners out there? <laughs> no, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, just keep hustling, keep going. I know it's like current rough times and whatnot. People are saying, oh, COVID's going to end the world. Uh, but yeah, just keep focusing on your business. Don't listen to BBC News that much. And uh, yeah, just, just keep 
getting those connections and uh, yeah, like clients or, or investors, and uh, yeah, keep going forward. There we go. Spoke spoken like a true founder, uh, guys. Thank you so much yeah. for watching, listening. You can listen to this on podcast in a couple of days. This will be uploaded. Actually, no, you don't need to know when this is uploaded because you'll know because you'll be watching it. Um, so, guys, thank you again. Really appreciate it. We'll tune back in next time for some real stuff, guys.